I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. This week I'm speaking to Barbara Wilkinson, a trustee of the Herb Society, which was founded in 1927 in order to promote the use and understanding of herbs and to provide a worldwide forum for the exchange of ideas and information pertaining to these plants. We talk about growing herbs in different garden situations, unusual herbs to grow and why humans seem drawn to them. We talk about what Barbara refers to as generous herbs and why we seem to enjoy abusing them by cramming them in unsuitable containers. And most importantly, what even is a herb? I start by asking Barbara to explain what the Herb Society does. Yes, certainly. It's a charity that um, is now 94 years old, which is quite incredible and uh, amazing to think that many people have never even heard of us. Um, it used to be quite a closed community back in the day when um, the lady who was the founder, Hilda Lale, started it. You had to be a member to be part of her group so that she could actually treat you because she was a herbalist herself. And as life went on and governments intervened and medical acts started coming in, she was uh, instrumental in being involved in ensuring that herbalists could still work and that people can have a choice about the health care and use herbal medicine. So she was she was very passionate about that. And on, on her death, it then became the charity. Before that, it was the Society of Herbalists. So it's changed a lot along that period of time of 94 years. Um, and it's mainly run by groups of volunteers. And obviously, volunteers come and go. Um, there are paid people these days. You have to pay for key tasks. So things change. So we do have some... Um, payments that we have to make to like editorial teams and finance and admin support, but they all work part time and the rest of us are part time volunteers on the council. And to, today we, we, we've really doing very much what we've always done, which is trying to inspire people and bring people the confidence to use herbs in, in every shape and form. Hilda was a herbalist and her focus was very much medical, but she was also very interested in food being medicine and a good cook. And she also was an author. and She wrote cookbooks as well as helped Maud Grieve with her book, The Modern Herbal, which is still on the shelves today for every course in the land that's teaching people to be herbalists. Um, it's still very relevant. It's on the, te- you know, on the teaching list. So today, uh, what we are very much involved with is um, folklore, history, heritage, culinary, horticulture, medicinal side, and of course, bringing together the new research and the science, because things are always developing, um, just like the recent renaming of rosemary and things of that sort, and it becoming part of the salvia um because its DNA has been recognised as, as closely linked. So we're there to really present knowledge and information. And we are, in fact, the only society that is all about herbs. There isn't another magazine even that's produced. The magazine that we do is for our members. Membership's very easy to gain both online and through events. But we are, in fact, the, the only society that um, is just about herbs, but in every walk of life, because the aim is to keep them alive, literally, in every sense of the word, and to have them used. Mm. So do you focus just on herbs from the UK? No, no, we, we focus worldwide and we have communications worldwide. And there are a few countries that have herb societies. America has some and Australia has some. And we communicate with them and we're just rebuilding because it gets lost over time, those connections, again, because of volunteers coming and going. So we're just um, starting again the lines of communication and assisting those societies and drawing on knowledge and information that they have and having a good exchange. And that's really what we want to do, because 
if you take Instagram, which I do the posting for the charity, in the three years that we started, we've got 28,500 followers worldwide. So with people in all sorts of countries that are interested in following us. So naturally, when we don't just focus on what we've got in the UK. And, and most herbalists don't use just UK homegrown herbs. They will often use herbs from all different cultures and different countries. And then there's what we call the Western herbal medicine, which tends to be what we think of as UK. But we're so integrated now. We're so well-traveled, well-informed that many, many herbalists and, and people, you know, the amateur would be buying things like turmeric now, for example, which they would never have used 20 years ago unless it was known about culturally. Yeah, we can buy that as a houseplant now, can't we? We can. We can even grow our own. You can get the, your own roots. Many shops sell them. And you can, yeah, you can grow it very successfully as a houseplant. It's part of the ginger family and it's, it's fun to grow. It's a bit like some of us, it doesn't like the cold and the frost, so it needs that protection. <laughs> but it's a, it's a very interesting plant and a very beautiful looking plant. And um, I'm one of those people that thinks that if you really want to get to know plants, you have to grow them. That's that's the connection that, that you need. You have to watch and wait, observe, because the plant teaches you so much. What I was wondering when I was kind of reading about the society and stuff, it, it suddenly struck me. I don't, I, ca- I don't know what herb is. What is a herb? You know, what do, yeah, what do you class as a herb? Can a tree be a herb? Because if you think about it from the sort of medicinal point of view, then obviously lots of things fall under that category. But yeah. how do you define it at the society? Okay, well, it's always an interesting question, and often at events um, we get asked that question. And if you look in the dictionary definition, it's too limited. Actually, it mentions flowers and seeds uh, and leaves, and that's about it. But in reality, it's every part of plants that do involve trees as well. Um, if you think of slippery elm, it's the bark that we use. If you think of the cloves that grow on trees, Brazil nuts that grow on trees, the food, they're also medicine, they're also herbs. So it's a much wider range than that. And we actually put it on our leaflet, um, which we give to people, our definition. And it covers everything because it's roots, barks, seed flowers leaves it's it's every every part if you take the nettle as a prime example we use the young leaves we then wait until it's flowered we then take the seed and then in the winter we use the roots so potentially some herbs will be every part of it it depends which particular one that you look at but the dictionary certainly isn't isn't right (laughs) it's too (laughs) limiting much too limiting Definitely. So who co- coined the term kind of herb in that sense? Is it just a historical thing? I, I presume it, I presume it's been used yeah. for centuries. Yeah, it would, have, it would have been used for centuries. And that's how you get names and references like herbology, which sounds very old, doesn't it? Very old school. And yet there's still courses that run like the Royal Botanics up in Edinburgh. They, they run herbology courses. So there's, there's courses for all different levels and different aspects, but the word itself will have come from other other sources. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, again, when I was thinking about herbs, growing them myself down in the southeast of England, um, I think a lot of people associate herbs with very light soil and a sunny aspect. Um, is that true? Do you think that, you know, is that can we apply yeah. that generalisation? No, I think it's far from that. Um, but you're right, that's how many people do think. And they, they tend to classify herbs as well, which rather limits the imagination and the, the gardening, really, and, and everything else that we want to think about with herbs. People think of like a, a term Mediterranean herbs, and they immediately think of the rosemaries and the lavenders and the thymes, which, yes, they like the free-draining light soils, and they like a lot of sunshine as well. So you have to look really at where the plant originates from. And that's quite fascinating when you delve deeper because a lot of plants that we accept as ours and that perhaps UK plants have actually come from all over the world. So it's the climate and the environment that we then put them in as to whether they're a success or a failure. And some do want very free draining. Um, and they do want a fairly light soil, but then there's others that need other conditions. So it's 
it's that thing about getting to know the plant, truly getting to understand its needs and requirements and working with that, working with nature in the way that we're intended to do so that we get to fully understand and get more connected with nature. Mm. Also, I, thinking about the sort of sunshine and the, I suppose that increases the potency of the of the oils in things like rosemary. So, yes. again, is the sunshine linked to the efficacy yes. of a plant? Does it make it more potent? Yes, it definitely does. And, for example, the one we mentioned um, earlier, the turmeric, if you grow it in India, Sri Lanka, there's much more sunshine. And they, in their Ayurvedic medicine, would only ever use the fresh roots. They wouldn't use the dried powder. But can you imagine the potency of the turmeric that's coming from those hot climates and the types of soil? Because all plants draw up from the earth, the minerals and all the different aspects, the good and the bad. So dependent on what environment we put those herbs, including how sunny it is, that's why coriander for example in the in the heat of the uk sun and we've had a bit of that this year it it doesn't do particularly well because it doesn't like to be too hot and exposed in the sun whereas when it's a bit cooler at the beginning of the year or like from now on the seed germinates better and the plant grows better so it's getting to know which conditions suit it but you're absolutely right sarah the the fragrance factor those volatile oils which the likes of peppermints and lavenders sages, rosemaries, the volatile oils, as we call them, they are heightened. And that's why, really, Greek oregano from Greece is far better from the fragrance factor with the volatile oils than really what we can often grow in this country. And that's why when we go on holiday and we taste it, we think, oh, this isn't like the one I have back at home. It's a bit like wine mm, <laughs> and yeah. other things. Yeah, they taste different when we're on holiday, don't they? Yeah. Than the ones that we then buy and we bring back. Because often the ones that we buy to bring back, um, they often sell us not quite the same quality either. <laughs> but the taste but the taste is completely different. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we know from even growing in the UK, you're in the south, I'm I'm in the north, I'm in the Cheshire region myself, so what I'm growing will be different to what you're growing. And the fragrance, the taste, and the other properties of the herb might be very different. Mm. God, I never thought about terroir in terms of herbs. That's an amazing yeah. thought. Um, actually, I, I went up to Whitby last year and I went, I visited the Abbey and they've got a little plant stand up there and I bought a herb and I don't know how to pronounce it. I've been calling it Dittender, but I don't know if that's... A Dittany, Dittany, uh, yeah. Yeah, Dittany. And it's, um, it said, don't put it in the garden because it's, you know, it goes everywhere. And of course, being a big head, I stuck it straight in the garden and, and it has <laughs> gone everywhere everywhere but people are always amazed because they they say oh, i've never heard of that it's um you know it's really mm. unusual but it is it is a bit of a a thug um and it made yeah. me think again people sort of maybe assume that if they're going to build a herb garden it's going to be all gravelly and mediterranean but can you think of any good herbs that grow in sort of either he- heavy soil or or even in the shade oh yes completely different um in fact in my small garden i've got uh, I'm south facing. So in the fierce sunlight on the patio area, a lot of plants won't thrive, won't do well, and they would toil. And I'd include in that bracket mint, because mint really likes quite a lot of moisture and it doesn't like full sun. It gets sunburn. Mm. It really doesn't enjoy it. And there's, there's hundreds of mints, but the majority of them, they just don't particularly like being in full, fierce, bright sunlight all day long. It's a bit like other plants, um, the camellias early in the year. If they get the early morning sunlight on them when they've had a, a frosty evening, then it shrivels and kills the flower heads off. And it's it's the same with all our herbs, placing them in the right position as to what they prefer. I'm growing hydrastis at the moment, um, golden seal, a, a herb which many medical herbalists pay an absolute fortune for. Um, it was over harvested in the wild and now it's being more sustainably managed and supplied. Um, and one certainly hopes so. So you have to check your supplier if you're a herbalist. But you can actually grow it yourself in the UK and very few think to do so. But you see, it's giving it the right conditions. 
and it likes to be on the edge of woodland, so semi-shade. And it does quite well in a heavier soil. And it's the roots that we use in medicine and that we're, that we're growing. But it's a very attractive plant. I think any gardener would love it because it's a very interesting leaf. Small flower, part of the buttercup family. The, the flower fades and then it develops a lovely red, almost berry looking centre in the middle of the leaf. It's very attractive. Um, and of course, we'd like lots of it in the UK. And yet people haven't been thinking to grow it. Well, there's a few that are now. Um, because they're beginning to realise that, you know, it's better to be more self-sufficient in your herbal supply. And this current crisis has very much shown that on every level in the food industry and everything, hasn't it? Yeah. And it's it's what many of us as herbalists have been trying to do because um, many medical herbalists buy product in and they'll buy it from all over the world. But, you know, herbalists back in the day and many of us now want to be truly connected with nature and understand the plant. Because if you understand the plant, you'll make the right choice for the patient. Because there's so many plants with similar properties, but how do you choose the right one for the right patient? It's all about the individual, and the plants are as individual as we are. So for shady plants, to answer your question, <laughs> I'd definitely be growing hydrastis, and I am doing. But it's, um, it's at the bottom, of just away from the hedge, so it's getting rainwater. This is the bottom of the garden where it gets the morning light, but not any fierce sunlight. And it's doing really well. And sanguinarias, uh, which many gardeners grow, sanguinaria candensis, blood root, is another root that we use. And that likes exactly the same conditions. So it'll take a heavier soil. And then when you think of heavy, most gardeners think of clay. I don't they? they often refer to clay type soils and, and what can I grow? Well, the mints are perfect. The shrubs are perfect, the viburnum oculus, uh, which again is a tree and the bark that we would use. Um, the motherworts, which are part of all part of the mint family, like lemon balm, they do really well actually in semi shade or even, you know, full shade. Um, sweet woodruff doesn't like the sun particularly, not too fierce. Um, it, it needs its roots protecting, it doesn't like to dry out. And it'll cope with some semi-shade and it'll cope with it quite like it's good drainage. But, you know, gravel on top of clay, it does very well. Yeah, I've tried to get sweet woodruff going in a couple of different places in my garden. And again, everyone says, oh, don't let that loose. It's, you know, it'll be everywhere. Uh, but actually, it just it's no problem. But it, it doesn't really like it in my garden, particularly. Um, I don't know why. Maybe it's too sunny thinking about it. But. Yeah. Yeah, if it dries out, it really doesn't like it. It shrivels up and the, and the roots, the roots will still be there um, and they'll get some moisture from the rain eventually, but they don't, they don't like full baking sunlight really. Mm. But when you think of the nature of the herb, sweet woodruff was used as a strewing herb. So it was literally thrown on the castle floors, those big flags you can imagine. And you would tread on it and the fragrance would come up. So it would help to keep things out that you don't want um fleas lice whatever else might be in the castles <laughs> coming in but it also creates a beautiful fragrance and it was just then swept up and replaced it's you know the things that it contains actually um are beautiful when trodden on so in in many situations it's perfect in a gravel path and let it spread because if you stand on it it doesn't matter you'll have lots of it mm. and you'll get the fragrance as you stand on it people think to do that with time in between paths and cracks and pavements, but they tend to forget that there's many other herbs they could use as well in that situation. Mm. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, I'm designing a herb garden at the moment in in, in a garden that I work in, um, and I, I kind of thought, well, a lot of the people that come here that say to me, I'd really like a herb garden, or I'm trying to get a herb garden going at home. Some Some just want it for an ornamental feature, others want to use the herbs. Um, mm. and it, and it struck me that actually I can't think of anyone who at some point hasn't hankered after a herb garden and they are mm. so, so popular. I mean, do you think there, I might be sort of overanalyzing it, but I do wonder if there's maybe a sort of deeper need in people that 
makes them have that connection to herb gardens and feel like they need one or they need one close at hand. I mean, as soon as I got in my house, I put one in my front garden. So it was right there. I just, you know, I don't know whether that's yeah. the kind of cultural thing that we've just got used to reading garden magazines where it says have your herbs to hand so you can harvest them for the kitchen or whether it's yeah. something as humans where we kind of just gravitate towards herb gardens. Yeah, yeah, I, we do gravitate towards them. We always have done as our ancestors did, you know, even when we would have gone out and not really had gardens, when we were in our tribes and we would have gone off foraging, we we had to learn and we had to explore and we had to discover for ourselves. And I think as soon as you get a home of your own, I think things do change. Um, when you're under the roof of your parents, I think many people are less interested. It's the parents' domain. But as soon as you get something of your own, even a flat, you know, with a bit of a balcony or a windowsill, you want to start growing things because we are part of nature ourselves and we have this built-in need to be around nature and have greenery and colour in our lives. And we we know, and now we've got the science to back it, that having plants around us actually affects our brain signalling and it improves our not only mental health but physical health. Um, our overall well-being is is much improved, whether we're out gardening or whether we're just walking in nature. It has such a big impact on us. So when people see gardens, they're naturally drawn to any type of garden. But the herb garden does rather reflect heritage and history, but it also connects people with nature, environment, culture, memories, fragrance, everything art design and and lifestyle aspirations as well for some um but herbs they're really and truthfully to be used and that's why they're generous and that's why most of them do really well some would say invasive i would say they're generous and they do really well and it's because they're there to be used some shouldn't be brought into the garden or the allotment and those are lessons that we learn as we work with nature, they're better to be in the wild and for us to go out and get them from the wild because they might be that bit too invasive, do too well. And some don't like too rich a soil that might be in the garden, for example, coming back to that environment and the earth and what they actually require and how they do well. But I do think, yeah, they've always been popular. They've always been in fashion. They've come in all sorts of shapes and styles uh, because fashions and trends tend to dictate don't they there's people who have actual businesses that plan what we're going to be aiming at in the future and what we should be looking at so there's always sort of the media encouraging things but deep down it's our connectedness with nature it's something we all want and we all know that we need to be a part of we need a patch of our own land really or at least one of a a plant that we can live with Mm. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, exactly that. Um, I was also reading a magazine, talking of reading magazines, and there was a feature in there on growing herbs. And th- we we seem to kind of think herbs are open to uh, our abuse. And I, I wonder if that is because some are so vigorous. But quite often, you know, you see them being stuffed into really unsuitable containers um so this particular article that i did highlight on social media um had i think maybe a mint stuffed into a tin can strapped to a fence and i thought well (laughs) you know that's not gonna last that's just you know it's just not yeah just not gonna happen um but we often see that with herbs um Mm. are there any herbs that do suffer that sort of abuse of being shoved into a pallet on stuck yeah. on a wall with you know barely any soil can you think of anything yeah. that's that vigorous that would actually cope with you know if someone's got a really un- unpromising site yeah you, you do see it all the time sadly and um it's that thing about showing people instant gardening um i think our society very much wants everything now and wants the end product and so many people don't really want to grow from seed or watch and wait um they they want it all instant and i think that's what you often see um certainly on different social media pages and in certain magazines and it's it it is as you say it's a sin to nature actually because you know full well that the the person will go to work and they'll even forget to water it let alone you know it can't anything in a pot is dependent on us isn't it 
Um, and if we position it under the um, rain shadow, where it's like an umbrella because it's, it's next to the, a wall or it's near a hedge or something, it can't even get water, poor thing. So it's, it becomes totally dependent. And the things like mints, I, I see all the time mints in a pot. And people say, what have I done to it? Well, often it's in the wrong position. It's in that full sun all day long. But it hasn't been fed. And it also hasn't been moved out of the pot and divided up. And mint has a habit of going around in circles. It's a good survivor. It tries really hard. But it's it grows rapid. As you know, if you put it in the garden and you let it loose, then you'll never be without it. I think Monty Dell did that a few years ago when he created a herb garden. And speaking to the television at the time, you'll live to regret that, Monty. Because you, you can't really get rid of those roots. They'll be there forever unless you bring the diggers in, I suppose, and start again. But, yeah, so many plants, they, they do suffer. And it's and it's our ignorance, really, and, and our neglect. And during the recent crisis, lots of people have got into gardening and have been absolutely loving it. And I, and I just hope that they remember when they're back at work and the time's committed to other things that they have to look after those plants and that patch that they've got. Because you see it on allotments, a terrific amount. They come with the rose-tinted spectacles early in the year when the plants aren't out of the ground. In January, it looks nice, bare soil. <laughs> By April, they're overwhelmed and they're giving up, yeah. <laughs> many of them, because gardening is something you have to learn. But it's about learning the cycles of nature, living with the seasons, understanding how things work. You know, so you have to watch and wait, really. But but instant gardening is not the way to go. Unfortunately, the um, televisions and the, and the magazines do it. And even the garden centres and places, they, they prepare plants now because society demands that they see them in flower. Because they, they don't know what they're going to be like when they've just emerged from the ground or before they've even come into bud. People want them when they're in flower, which is really quite sad. But that's how instant society has become. They want it and they want it now. And what they forget is if you cram plants together, then they get a weaker immunity. They'll, they'll succumb to diseases. They'll end up with mildew and rust and other problems because there isn't enough airflow. So while you're hoping for a, a nice garden look, you may you may spoil it by cramming them in and not giving them what they actually need to survive and thrive and do really well. And you end up with sick looking plants and things that will die on you. And you can lose a lot of money and a lot of time as well as a result. So it's worth planning and watching and waiting and giving things time. It saves you money too in the long run. Yeah, and it, uh, it it annoys me because it's that sen- it's that false promise, and I think people sometimes, if they don't have a lot of experience with gardening, they'll try something and it will fail, and they get, you know, yeah. despondent, and then they give up, and it's such yes. a shame. You know, it's very sad if people get put off just because of silly it is. In magazines and stuff. But we have a wonderful poster called the Companion Planting Poster, and companion planting is nothing new. But it's worth knowing about and finding out about because all plants give off chemicals. They all contain different constituents. Some, as we know, we've talked about fragrance and in the leaf and the flower, we can actually smell the fragrance. But the roots also are giving things off. But every plant is connected to the earth and to the other plants around it. And some plants will help other plants thrive and grow and to avoid illness and disease. And yarrow is a typical one. Achillea, yarrow, it, it grows in the wild. It's a super looking plant for all sorts of things and for wildlife and everything. But it's actually known as a plant healer. So if you plant it alongside other plants, the other plants around it will do really well. Whereas if you put other plants that are giving off other chemical constituents, they might actually make the plant ill quite sickly or even kill it. So it's, some, it's really useful knowledge and that is difficult to teach because it takes a lifetime, really, of observation, of knowledge, and of acquiring knowledge to know what to put next to each other or near each other, because some plants offend one another and some plants will kill one another, whereas others will actually encourage them to grow and grow successfully. And really, we all want the latter, don't we? <laughs> mm. 
Can you recommend maybe three unusual herbs that people might not have heard of or tried? Well, they may have heard of them, but they certainly might not have tried some of them. Um, and I know a lot of gardeners are forever removing things that they give quite a bad name to, things like they even call them weeds, when actually all weeds are herbs. Uh, it's just our lack of knowledge, so it's our own ignorance of not how best to be able to uh, work with the plant, sadly. And one of them at this time of the year, because actually it needs quite a bit of rainfall, it's not one that likes being scorched in the sun, but chickweed is a herb that actually I'm always delighted to see. You can see it growing in the crack in the pavement and at the corner and all sorts. You've got to avoid the dog pee line, of course, and um, other things that might happen. But if it appears on your allotment or in your garden, then feel blessed, actually, because it's a salad crop. And it's what for centuries we've always eaten. We've waited for it to come into season and to utilise it. And, and we've known that it's full of vitamins and minerals and antioxidants and all the things that we want. And it's really good for the skin. It's an excellent herb. So every herbal dispensary in the UK will have Stellaria, which is chickweed, and they will use it. And one of the main purposes is to help dampen down inflammation um, and it helps the skin to stop being itchy and irritable so when you think of symptoms of any sort any rash any eczema any any psoriasis then chickweed but we don't just apply it externally we take it internally and the more that you take internally of course the better your immunity and your nutritional density so chickweed is one that's sadly gets a bad rap and in actual fact, I encourage everybody to be eating it. There are no side effects, only benefits. Yeah, I don't have any chickweed actually, so. Um... I bet you want some now. Well, I have been. <laughs> I have actually been seeking it out, um, but it isn't very common around for some reason where I am. Um, but yeah, mm. I've, I've definitely been keeping an eye out for it. Mm. Yeah, it's a good. It's a good herb to know. Another one that might be in your locality is called fat hen. And it's actually related to the quinoa family. And we pay quite a lot of money to often have it imported. Now there's a UK grower um, supplying it, I'm pleased to say. But the quinoa has become very, very popular because it's high in protein. And it's good for people who are vegan and vegetarian. It's a good alternative. But frankly, it's good for anybody because it's nutritionally dense. And yet we can get our own from the fat hen plant, the one that's very... Um, generous. It's on most allotments in the UK. You see it in all sorts of places. So learning identification as to which plant is which and then working with them and seeing when they're at the best to be able to harvest them. And in this case with fat hen, it's the young leaves you would take and you can use again as a salad crop or a vegetable. As they get older, like most leaves, they get a bit tough and then you wait for it to come into seed and take the seeds and that's your quinoa. And you can use it fresh or you can dry it and store it. Mm. But a wonderful herb. Yes, I do get that one. That one is more common. Not not very common, but yes. But yeah. I see more of that. Mm. That's a good tip. Now, another herb which I think is going to come back into popularity in the UK, which has fallen out of favour, is licorice. Mm. And people think the UK... Um, you know, as from a heritage point of view, we used to have Pontrefact, the area in Yorkshire, and there used to be Pontrefact cakes, all made from licorice, which was grown in that region. So it would be grown there because the weather conditions and the soil conditions would have been just right for it. It's a bit like the rhubarb triangle also up in Yorkshire. So right conditions, so the plant thrives. But licorice will do well in many parts of the UK. And it's something that fell out of favour and it needs to come back. Um, certain generations would remember going to the herb shop and, and buying um, a stick of licorice, which was actually the root, which you would chew on it to keep it quiet for a long time because it took some chewing to get the licorice out. But that's what herbalists still use today. They usually get it in the chopped form or make tincture out of it or use it in the tea blends or um, decoctions because with roots you have to make more than just an infusion. But licorice... I'm sure it will be a herb of the future because of what's just been happening in this country, because it's part of the immune respiratory 
supply of herbs and they have been having a lot of use in the last few months as you can imagine they always do anyway in the uk in winter because we're always looking to support the immune system and strengthen ourselves ready in the autumn ready for winter coming in um but licorice with the general public fell out of favor and it, it is a bit of a love hate a marmite thing but in reality it's a super herb and people aren't growing it and it, it can become a big shrub a really big plant and because it's part of the pea and the uh, legume family it's a nitrogen fixer as well so it's an interesting plant yeah i did see somebody actually a uk um supplier um and they were selling i think it was like grow your own licorice kits actually but that, and that was maybe a couple of years ago um yeah so yeah hopefully it will be having a bit of a renaissance um i won't be particularly excited because i'm <laughs> one of the people that can't stand it but never mind um no my other half likes it so maybe we, we can get yeah some. <laughs> um yeah awesome. i think it got mentioned funnily enough on one of the gardening programs just the other week mm. and um james wong was saying that he thought he didn't like licorice but he discovered it's the aniseed that they put in the sweets oh yes, and that's what puts people off yes. and if you just had licorice it's a completely different flavor oh. and not many people have had true licorice that's it then no because i can't stand yeah. aniseed yeah that'll be what puts me off oh well in that case yeah i may well like it Interesting. yeah and it's and it's a sugar alternative and it's a mild laxative and it's got many medicinal properties but it's excellent for the lungs and respiratory system right okay all right well i will i may be well may well try it um <laughs> so can you think of any um resources obviously the herb society is a great resource so you know please tell, talk about that and where people can find you and find out a bit more but um you know just in general if people would like to explore herbs more um yeah you yeah know, how can they kind of well how can they help you how can they get involved well there's lots of resources out there and most people these days only think of looking online there are a lot of good online resources um, it depends what you're looking for. Um, if you're looking for amateur level, whether you're looking for horticulture, medicine, whatever you're looking for, there are courses around the country um, at different different levels, amateur and professional, and to become practitioners. So there's all, all sorts of courses, but there are also some super books, and owning a book is is wonderful to actually build up your knowledge in your library and it's something you can keep going back to and there are some key books that i would recommend one is the evolutionary herbalism book the science spirituality and medicine from the heart of nature wonderful book another one an old an older book is all about tree medicine by peter conway a super book 170 trees are discussed in the book and just recently, um, one of the book reviews, because the Herb Society charity does do book reviews and puts them both in the members magazine and the majority of them go on the website. And a colleague of mine, Lucy Jones, wrote a super book this year about self-sufficient herbalism. And we come from the same background and we share the same interest in that we want to grow our own herbs and use them as food and medicine and encourage others to do so. And the book isn't about um, the usefulness, which is what we get asked a lot, because we herbalists generally don't look at the usefulness. We find it a bit disrespectful. Um, we work in a, in a slightly different level to that. But Lucy's book is about how to grow, harvest, dry, store, things of that sort. So it's, it's super. And any books by Matthew Wood, I would strongly recommend as well. Um, is a herbalist who's written a number which are absolutely super. But the Herb Society itself is about bringing people together as communities, sharing knowledge and enlightening people and also hopefully inspiring people. So the charity has um, membership both for corporate members and for individual membership and with members all around the world. And really we like our membership to be very much involved in the community and to be involved in right, the, the blog, the articles, all sorts of things, and also to help run the um, Herb Society charity. So to work as volunteers with whatever skill set and expertise they've got, they'd always bring something to the party and they'd always be very welcome. And in actual fact, that's the only way we can survive. 
because we don't get any funding. Um, we haven't got money from external sources, so we are reliant on volunteers. And it's lovely to work with people. We humans are very sociable. We like to communicate with others. We've all got different skill sets and we need the skills from all the different areas. And it's it's a nice community to be in. We've For the last three years, we've had a president who's been Alice Fowler, um, who's an author and a gardener and very enthusiastic about the environment and nature, as those of you that know her will be aware. So she's she's been great to work with. And um, it's thanks to Alice that we even started social media and that the Instagram page started. So she really brought us into the next century. And we're now hoping, thanks to you, Sarah, with inviting us to do this podcast, we're hoping that others will do the same because we'd like to be able to be able to promote the charity um, in all ways. And as they say, it's always good to talk. It definitely is good to talk especially if the person you're talking to is as knowledgeable and lovely as Barbara. Thank you, Barbara, for being a marvellous guest and thank you to you too for listening. And you know, I like talking to podcast listeners as well, so do feel free to get in touch with me. Dr Ian Bedford is going to play us out talking about a bug that is the nemesis of Identikit Gardens the length and breadth of the home counties and also of Monty Don. The trade in plants and produce over recent years has become quicker and easier between countries throughout the world. But unfortunately, it's increased the potential for introducing foreign plant pests to new locations. These invasive species usually arrive without any of the predators and parasites that naturally keep their populations under control within their countries of origin. So without these natural enemies, the invaders have the freedom to rapidly increase the numbers and disperse within their newfound homeland. And this has been the case in Britain, with species such as the red lily beetle, harlequin ladybirds, western flower thrips, and more recently, the horse chestnut leaf miners and the Spanish slug. As time progresses, though, it's to be expected that the natural enemies of similar native species will start to recognise and accept the foreign species as a new food source, and will begin to slow down the speed of their invasion. But one thing's for certain, that whilst the global exchange of plant material continues, the appearance of foreign plant pests will have to be expected. Currently, there's one new invader that's not only causing concern for Britain's topiarists, but could sadly change the appearance of the country's many historic formal gardens. This is the box tree moth, a native to East Asia that was first discovered in Britain infesting box balls in a private garden near London in 2011. But within three years, quickly spread and became established across the capital city and into the surrounding areas. This medium-sized moth, recognisable by its white wings with an iridescent brown border, is still continuing to spread and has now been recorded throughout much of England, Wales and more recently Ireland. Box tree moths lay their eggs exclusively on box plants and as their caterpillars feed they cause severe defoliation, dieback and cover the plants in white webbing within which they spin cocoons and pupate. Although their biology is not yet fully understood it is thought that up to three generations can occur each year and that through the winter months the box tree moth survives as small caterpillars hidden in You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk, where you'll also find my blog and a sign up form for the newsletter, which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All. Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All. Roots and All.